Hey gang, thanks to those of you who joined me for the live stream. So we had a lot of good discussions around this and I'm wanting to do another one of those live streams here pretty quick with members of the carnival just kind of talk about sitcom what we saw what our thoughts are once we had a little bit more time to digest it uh, i still haven't nailed down when i'll do that but i'll let you know when i do this was a pretty info dense sitcom and pretty different from the ones in the past which i'll also get into but with so much info let's not waste a lot of time on an intro so there's timestamps in the down below bits let's get this The theme of the night seemed to be this. In past years, at its heart, sitcoms have been about, let's say, these are the tools we're making that we'll make the game with eventually. So everything was conceptual, pie in the sky, white box, hopium, basically. This year, the theme seemed to mostly be, these are the things that we're building with those tools so it was a subtle change yeah but a really significant one for this project that said let's just go ahead and get right into the panels this talk really felt like an ad for star engine it's all really cool stuff and definitely worth the watch just to see all the things the engine can do or will do eventually one day to that point this seemed to be aimed at other game developers as much as the community itself. So game developers outside of CIG to entice them to use this engine to make their own game at some point. For dev company, that's pretty much the dream as it's just passive income and a lot of it. For example, Crytek made Crisis and Crisis 2 and then pretty much never needed to make another game because they're making so much money from licensing out their engine rather than making the games. So would CIG go the same route? I could easily see... Chris Roberts using licensing out the engine to continue funding his baby Star Citizen Squadron 42 add-ons. So there wasn't a whole lot else to say about this particular panel, but the demos were impressive and I do recommend just watching it just to kind of get a general sense for what this engine is going to be capable of or is capable of now. For those of you in orgs, this is the one that you'll probably want to watch when it eventually gets uploaded. After a bit of an intro on how players interact, they switch gears and start talking about the very long-awaited org tools. As you can probably guess, this one was on the social aspects of the game. So making friends, grouping friends, finding groups of people to play with, and of course the aforementioned org tools. Of all the panels, this is the one that, at least on the surface felt the most conceptual, where the other talks all had videos, white box demos, gray box demos, fly throughs and the like. This panel did not. It was just screenshots of what they wanted the eventual interface to look like. A few people were taking that as disheartening, especially being the second panel of the convention, but I didn't necessarily see it that way. And yeah, this talk was conceptual and pretty much all just mock-up beauty shots of what they wanted it to look like. But this is UI stuff, so all on the Moby Glass and all using building blocks. So what's that mean? Yeah, this stuff might be first out the gates, even though the presentation seemed like it was the furthest behind. It'll take some nifty coding to do what they want it to do, but like a few other things I'll talk about in a bit, these kind of grouping tools, even with the usual CIG layer of complexity rolled in, is pretty well understood in gaming development in general. CIG has a broad base to build on, in other words. They had some really cool features, most of which circled around the ability to take notes on a player and group types of friends. That thing about being able to take notes on people that you've added as friends is one of those things that I never realized I needed until I saw it, and now I have to have it. Uh, basically, 
during my time playing this game, I have friends that I've added ages ago that I have no idea why I added them. I know for a fact that for some of them, I just took their side when there was some troll in chat, and that was as much as we interacted. On that note, there was also the ability to block other players. It didn't sound like you could block playing with them, but you could block them and that would mean that your chat wouldn't appear for them and theirs wouldn't appear for you. I mean, it is an MMO. You are expected to sometimes play with people you don't like. And yeah, sometimes people that are toxic. If they break the rules, CIG can still bounce them out of the game, though. So just keep that in mind. Finally, and this is for you solo players out there, or those of you who haven't quite found the org to join or don't really want to commit to that sort of thing, there are tools for grouping up for one-offs. So you could throw up on a social board that you need, say, three other people to go mole mining or 10 people to raid a bunker, that sort of thing. Likewise, you could log in and look at those boards and say, hey, that sounds like fun. I want to join those three other guys and do this thing if they have an opening in that post. Of course, this would tie into rep, too, so both sides could see what they were dealing with. If someone has a rep for ganking their teammates, for example, that would show up in their rep rating. So, yeah, this is worth checking out, even if you're solo. I know that I said that it was org tools, but it's not just org tools. Pico 1, onwards. So this one just took a left turn out of nowhere. This one started out with character, okay, I'm going to say classes, but that's not really what they were. More statistics, buffs and the like that your clothing choices would give you. Kind of disappointingly, but kind of keeping with the theme of the convention, they mostly focused on combat. So wearing this suit would make you a tank, slow you down, and make you highly damage resistant. In turn, you'd be highly unstealthy and not mobile. On the flip side, the dude wearing civvies was super mobile, but obviously his leather jacket wasn't going to be tanking much damage. And they had a bounty hunter suit that was good at scanning, and if you had the whole suit, all the pieces of these various suits, the synergy would give you a further bonus buff to what that suit was good at. But then they showed off something we've been asking for for ages, the ability to mix and match armor and clothing. So you could wear a chest plate over a shirt or just the arms or wear a backpack, that sort of thing. But through the demonstration, they were talking about building a team. Of course, this was the talk where they mentioned a legendary friend from sitcoms past, which I kind of settled on being Jeremiah Lee coming back and doing like a presentation or a talk or just kind of having fun with Jared. And well, nope, it was the Valakar, the sandworm. So some of you all called that one. And I thought that was ridiculous as it wasn't even on my radar on a talk that was supposed to be about clothing. And yeah, probably at least... Half this talk was about the sandworm, lootables that would grow on the sandworm, how hard it would be to kill, and their ideas for some future gameplay like hunting. Pretty cool, pretty unexpected. The sandworm looks like it's no joke. It also looks like it's pretty close in the timeline, so maybe 4.0? Maybe it certainly looked like a possibility and the mission game loops look pretty far along to go along with it. They had an in-game demo after all. So very cool panel. If you like the Starby stuff, want to specialize in your role or are into sandworms or hunting sandworms. For my part, I was hoping they'd toss in something about the non-combat specialist suits that they mentioned a couple years back, but not a for this one. It's still worth watching. This was the one where they talked about what system would be coming after Pyro or systems, which was kind of welcome since we'll A, be getting Pyro itself very soon, and B, they've been talking about every aspect of Pyro for about four years now. There was a ton of great footage of Nixon here, which surprised the next system up. That part was predictable, but Delamar is looking good, as is Levski, and this was my favorite LZ for a brief period that it was actually in the game, and I know I'm not alone on that. They didn't talk about Rekka, who is the mission giver, but I'm sure we'll just have to wait and see her. I'm sure she and Edlin will be back, though. 
there was space for another star system and they kind of dropped a big surprise on us. The next system after Nix will be Castra, which again, wasn't on my radar as being a possibility of one of those systems. I was thinking Magnus or maybe Odin, but they went with Castra. So Castra was a heavy military system during the Cold War with the Xi'an. And some of that still exists, with there being a sizable UE naval base there. If Stanton is mildly lawful, this system will be basically untouchable by unlawful players. Although smugglers, like the Carnival, allegedly, might find ways in and around that. All about risk reward, am I right? But anyways, that risk reward thing was something they were keying on. Pyro will be straight up dangerous and lawless, literally. I mean, ganking will probably be required, but the riches you can get there will be substantial. And that's the balance with these systems that CIG is settling on. The more risk you take, the bigger the rewards. But those risks will be real. You won't be soloing into pyro and then crying when someone blows you up, or you can, but you should have expected to get blowed up if you dig what I'm saying. Again, solo players will probably have to group up using those social tools. Even if you don't want to hire escorts, if you have a group of, say, 10 prospectors and you just scatter when the baddies appear, well, they can't blow all of you up, right? Someone will get away with the loot. Win-win? But anyways, the bomb they drop, get it, because it's a military system and they bomb the first plan the system into a toxic wasteland. Bomb because, well, it, it, no surprise here. This one was on Squad 42. Of all the panels, if there's one that probably generated the most drama, it was this one. We were taking bets and I even had a giveaway award that the person that guessed the correct release date. Turns out that Scarlet in our group and the carnival was closest with his guess that if they gave out a release date at all, it would be very general, like quarter three or something like that. So it turns out that the release date was 2026, so two years away. That said, I'd be surprised if it was October 2026, so maybe not a full two years away. But I said going in that CIG would need to have enough lead time to really roll out the marketing for the game. What would have really helped this demonstration would have been a clean playthrough of what I think was the first chapter. It had some bad crashes, which likely gave the haters more ammunition. But Chris was in the background saying, it has to be that computer. I played through that thing last night and it didn't crash once. And maybe I'm just part of the cult here, but I tend to believe that the crashes came at weird times and they weren't consistent. So it didn't always crash at this specific point in the demo. And they seem more time-based than content-based, but maybe Maybe that's just wishful thinking on my part. Anyways, the game looks pretty solid. Most of the first chapter was cinematic moments rather than actual gameplay, but the actual gameplay they showed was a really unique way of doing an entry level into a game. First off, they started you off in a turret, which looking back on it is kind of brilliant. You learn to shoot without having to learn how to fly at the same time. Granted, some of it felt a bit arcadey for my taste but again as an intro level i'm okay with that it's okay to hold someone's hand initially well before you shove them off a cliff i guess it felt high stakes and the acting was obviously good no surprise guess though so no hamill or cable like i was thinking Richard Tyre went through and recorded another playthrough after the convention, and that's the one that you'll find online right now. Still, respect to CIG for continuing to do these demos live. That warts and all approach has really kind of burned them a couple times now, but you absolutely know that you're getting the real thing. You're not just getting vaporware that they're not showing you what they're actually doing. It's worth watching. I think the game will bring in a lot of new blood when it eventually drops in 2026. And that, that was day one. Day two was thankfully shorter because this old man was pretty sleep deprived by this point. Day two was heavily focused on base building and it got kicked off with 
This panel went into the basics of base building, kind of picking up the torch from last year's closer that Todd Pappy did and then just beefing it up. They went through and explained how people would build up a base by bringing down the components and the associated buildings would require and using drones to build the thing out. Drones will come in different sizes and those sizes will determine how many buildings those drones can work on at once, as well as the size and the complexity of the buildings that those drones can build. The non-combat loops, particularly mining it seems, will have a huge role in this. They then start to talk about quality and how the quality of the ore you initially mined would have knock on effects all down the line with the high quality stuff being hard to find, but giving significant buffs to the final product, whatever that might be like, think weapons up to buildings, you'd get these knock on effects. Then they went on to say that we'd be able to use crafting machines to make weapons, tools, armor, and even ships. Yeah, ships. And a much bigger example of that was going to be dropped on us later. But as far as weapons, tools, armor, and even ships go, they were still building off of that base. So if they had higher quality components to start with, the end result would be a weapon or armor or ship that would have some buffs applied to it. So definitely an advantage of buying something out of a store. It's sure sounding like crafting will be a major game loop all on its own. If you're good at it and get the right recipes and blueprints, which you have to earn or buy in game, you can make a living for your character doing nothing else. They showed off how bigger groups and presumably a bunch of solos working together could pull off building bases that were starting to look like some of the player made settlements from Star Wars Galaxies. Given how many of the devs and the community were fans of that game, there's no real big shocker there, but the scale they were aiming for as well as the fidelity, yeah, it's, it's pretty impressive stuff. It seems like most of the non-combat roles will be hooking into crafting. So salvage and mining will be producing materials, science and exploration will be hunting down blueprints and recipes and so on. So pretty cool stuff, pretty cool demos, probably would have been the highlight of the show if it weren't for the last panel. But before that, of course, they had their ship sales show. Yeah, totally expected here in that little Argo CSV SM was first up. Slightly larger than a mule, this one carries four one SCU boxes in a flatbed in the back of the truck. Again, with the Atlas and tractor beams being a thing, I'm just not sure what this thing's role will be, but I'm sure it'll eventually be carving one out. We also know, thanks to leaks, that there will be a builder version, obviously for small buildings, that will be coming out in the nearest future. So that one's 40 bucks war bond. Also leaked, but we didn't know its exact role or when it would drop, was the Misk Star Lancer. This thing is kind of a tweener in size and is larger than the Connie. Fewer guns, more cargo, three versions, with two of them actually being on sale right now. The two on sale were the Max and the TAC, with the Max being the cargo mover and the TAC being the combat variant, complete with a tiny fury sized hanger on top. The Max goes for 225 war bond and the TAC is 295. Just my opinion, not a bad price for the Max, but for the TAC, I don't know. I mean, I guess there's just other ships that do it better. Maybe worth the CCU from a Connie, but if you're focusing on combat, I mean, I think I'd honestly stick with the Connie, but if you really like that MISC aesthetic and big bottom mounted turrets like what the A2 has, well, okay, I guess this one's probably for you. They kept the focus on building as well. Talking about construction grav carts with drones, there was a lot of detail in this chat about what the drones would actually be capable of. They talked about the Mirai Guardian, which is the Fat Fury concept that we saw last year, and the Legionnaire, which is still on ice thanks to them not being happy with the hacking game loop. And yeah, that was as much as they said about hacking at this year's con. Then they talked about the reconcept of the Pioneer, along with a suspiciously far along gray box for it. And yeah, I said gray box and not white box. They did the obligatory 
fly through of the pretty much complete Polaris, which is, or at least should be dropping on us in about a month. Then we got the new side scroll of the ships we were expecting to drop in the next year. Definitely some surprises with some easily recognizable. John Crew also made sure to emphasize that this was not an exhaustive list, and there were quite a few more ships in the pipeline. I'll see if I can name these or at least take a stab at them. Argo, CSV, BL, or some such, it's going to be the builder version. Maybe a tracked IUPC, probably a larger builder though, given the theme. Another Atlas chassis, probably the builder version that we saw in last year's sitcom. Hornet Ghost. Hornet Dracker. So that's the Terrapin Medivac probably, but hopefully we get a Terrapin rework. Mirai Guardian. Prospector rework, or maybe the rumored salvager variant? Maybe a larger cargo sled? It just looks really thin. Obviously Drake, maybe the Herald's big brother. Probably getting one of these too, honestly. Something Aegis, I'm thinking? Beyond that, no idea. Obviously this one's the Starlancer BLD, the construction variant. Oh, the Perseus. Looking forward to that one. And a surprise here, pretty sure this is the Ironclad, which I thought would be a few years off. And then, yeah, the damn Pioneer, I think. Definitely explains why the gray box was so far along if it is the Pioneer, though. Anyways, I didn't see the Galaxy in there, which is weird since the Galaxy was supposed to beat the Perseus out the door. So maybe the Perseus is making an appearance in Squadron 42. And there was no word on a 600i rework, the Kraken, the Merchantman. So those three ships aren't in the pipeline, at least not for now. They also talked for a hot minute about LTI and insurance, which Disco just clarified on a post on Spectrum. And I'll have another video on that coming up soon. Anyways, from here, we went on to the last panel. This was their final talk, and they used it to explain what they felt would comprise 1.0, the actual release of the game. They addressed the 100 systems thing by explaining that 1.0, their initial release, would be five systems. The fifth system, no surprise, turned out to be Terra, and they had some pretty nice art to go along with it. Richard Tyre also went on to talk about the expectations they had about game loops, which was basically all of them and in an almost finished state rather than a tier zero implementation. Then they talked about adding a bit of a story to the background that new players and I guess all players could engage with that would bring them through all five systems and give them a broad experience so that they could find their way in the verse. And it would end with the reward of citizenship, along with some bonuses that they could only get through that story. From what I remember, those playing through Squadron 42 would also gain citizenship in the verse by playing through that game. Uh, but they didn't mention that. So the story, it sounded like it was optional, but would serve the purpose of filling in someone about the universe they were gaming in if they hadn't been playing the damn thing for nearly 10 years. So necessary. But then they started discussing what the end game would be. And wow, even though I expected something like this eventually, I felt it was probably a few sticky notes on a desk or something at this point that would be a long way away from actual development. And nope, player space stations. A lot like the ground bases, these things will represent a huge amount of invested resources, but even more so. This appears to be the in-game goal for orgs in the game, to build one of these space stations. And at first glance, it doesn't seem very impressive. But then they started talking about the add-ons, and the thing became ridiculous. Gathering the resources to build the thing, and for the upkeep, which will also be of substantial apparently, will suck up a lot of focus for even the large orgs. There's even a chance that some of the larger orgs, particularly those who have leaned in heavily on a combat focus, will be tapping solo players and possibly industrial orgs to help them build these bases out. 
that leaves a ton of room open for negotiations, alliances, and so on. Still, these giant bases seem to strongly favor the largest orgs, which I personally think is a little worrying. I could see there being alliances of smaller orgs trying to match it up, or just get a group of people to work together and build a station and maintain it, without being a single unit or org. That could be really tricky, though. Could be tricky for the big orgs, too, not going to lie, because those things will be gigantic targets. And, oh yeah, they showed off that you could build a dry dock off of one, and if you had the resources and correct blueprints, you could make an actual bangle carrier just... Yeah. I mean, the original thought that CIG gave us years ago is that there'd be derelict bangles out there in the verse, and orgs could find them, get them running, but they'd never really have ownership of them, so other orgs and other players could take them away. Uh, but this sort of seems to be a better compromise by CIG, that you actually build your own and it's yours. Still, the whole base building thing looks like it's pretty far along in design, if not implementation. I don't think we'll be getting space stations in the next year by any stretch, but if you told me two to four years i'd i'd take that bet all in all i'd say catch us one if you want to know what cig thinks the game will be when they go to 1.0 if it's not your bag it might be time to jump off the train if it is your bag and you haven't jumped on the train yet i'd still say give it a year for those of you who are on this train with me, well, make some room because I have a feeling that we'll be getting our usual sitcom surge here in the next couple of weeks once they get the servers working. Catch me next time. Mm -hmm.